Namaste, welcome to uh, Ask Helen Anything, volume 21. And um, uh, before we get into what's been uh, sent in to uh, address today, just to let you know that the next one of these will be recorded um, towards the middle uh, of December, just after uh, around 18th and 19th of December. Um, and then the next one after that will be middle of February because we're in India for a month. So um, just a, a heads up there. So if you have anything uh, that comes out of this video or if you have anything that you want to ask uh, me to address or to look at, if you're challenged with anything, you can just leave this as a leave it as a comment underneath this YouTube video. And uh, in a month's time, just about, we'll uh, address it again together, uh, myself and Karen, and we'll uh, upload that once it's done. So we'll get started with what's uh, been sent in for this. Hi, Karen. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Helen. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. I'm ready. So our first uh, question is from Scott. Helen, please clarify. There is no separate doer. All we see is infinite intelligence pouring through all forms. We are just watching the resulting activity seemingly appear separate real. We are watching our movie, getting lost in it, and inferring a separate doer, believer, speaker, etc. That leaves some severe implications. This perspective helps us understand the big picture. However, if there is no control as a separate I, nor is the greater one, in, greater one intelligence doing anything, it is just watching its activity appearing. How do meaning and personal responsibility come into play? Hurting others does not seem to be something you want this teaching to infer under the assumption that you have no personal control or responsibility. So um, this, this kind of question is very common when we have um, kind of seen that there's no separate self to some extent and there, there is no doer of personal actions but um that that seeing hasn't gone completely deep so there isn't any personal responsibility in the way that we think uh, as human beings usually but what there is is the oneness the the one self experiencing itself through all of these human bodies and when the one uh, infinite self comes to recognize itself completely, that it is everything and everywhere and all appearing as all life, all human beings, uh, everything sentient, insentient, uh, and the formless essence of all of that. Then what we actually come to find is that it's impossible to hurt others. We can only uh, intentionally or unintentionally hurt others when we believe we're a separate being. So in the place of oneness, there really isn't any uh, way that we could cause any harm to anyone else because uh, everyone else is realized to be our own self and we have the, uh, the same um, love and care and best wishes for them as we would for our own body and mind. And that is across the board as it sinks deeper. Of course, some body and mind's um, individual appearances we might not resonate with on a, a personal kind of friendship level. And some, uh, we could say, body and minds are less evolved or, or not quite so far ahead in their awakening. We might not have a resonance with, but it is nonetheless impossible to hurt anyone from that place. It would be like hurting ourselves. And eventually we can't even have judgmental thoughts about others because uh, they'd seen clearly that there aren't any others. So personal responsibility, morality, all of that is, is necessary really for um, when we feel that we're a separate being. <clears throat> but the infinite being, uh, it is on one level just watching. It's watching uh, manifestation move uh, as it does. But there's also a kind of intelligence moving through the manifestation as well. Uh, if you look back on Darwin's theory of evolution, you'll see the infinite self appearing as all of these forms that get um, increasing, increasingly more complex and more able to understand their environment, more able to uh, experience, perceive, and eventually um, to ask questions 
to think and, and uh, as human beings evolve in their own awakening. Finally, to ask the question, where did I come from? What am I? Uh, who am I? What is the world? All of those questions that we look at in, in satsang, in our awakening. So there is a kind of uh, intelligence, even in the manifestation, in the way that it's evolving. It's evolving into ever more um, complex forms that can be more and more self-aware. And in that becomes uh, a compassion uh, eventually arises for all of existence. Of course, there are human beings alive on the planet that have not reached that place yet, and that's okay. But as uh, awakening really deepens, if there is no separate self, then everything is you. Everything. And nothing can be excluded from that. And in our self-inquiry, we see ourselves to be formless. And the body's appearing inside us. And that formlessness as we keep looking, we see it is everywhere. It has no edges. Awareness, consciousness, presence, whatever we want to call that. So... <clears throat> that one um, infinite consciousness is appearing as all of this. And in that, there is just a great love, a great love, compassion, wisdom, and an utter inability to uh, do anything violent, mentally, verbally, physically, all of that. And uh, so it's not that we don't want to harm others. There literally are no others. Literally. Uh, and with that, thoughts about others disappear and the mind goes quiet over time as this sinks in deeper. So, in fact, we've never been safer. And uh, all of that is when we realize who we really are. And that appears as uh, good morals, that appears as good personal responsibility. We do what's right for ourselves and others in the awakened way. But really, it's just a deep-seated knowing that there is no other in that everything is regarded with the same uh, care as we would regard our own self. So it's a common question, and it comes from some uh, place where we've gone into the oneness, but it's not fully hit what that actually means, that there is no separate self, no doer of actions, no decider of uh, decisions, no thinker of thoughts. It's all just unfolding according to the divine will, which is, always moving towards more uh, harmony, more peace, more love. Thanks, Karen. You're still muted there. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Brigitte. Dear Helen, thank you so much for your very loving and useful guidance. Would you say more about living without listening to the thoughts and the fact that there is no doer? What does it really mean? Do you just move around completely effortlessly? Do you really not think about how to do things? I love listening to the satsang about this. It helps me to surrender into my being and relax deeply. Thank you and love, forget. Yeah, it's kind of um, you, you're realizing yourself more to be that awareness, which is just watching uh, the human body. So right now, there's a feeling of... Um, feeling isn't the right word but there's a sense that I'm just watching my body say these words and I've got no idea what's going to come out of my mouth um it's just happening spontaneously but because my identity has shifted deeply to the realization of who I am which is everywhere whatever uh, actions words and thoughts arise from there tend to be in line with that oneness and um and kind of day-to-day <clears throat> -day experience then is of just watching uh, the body move around and do what it needs to do. It's even doing this uh, recording here for YouTube uh, all by itself. And I find the body to be amazingly efficient and kind and caring and compassionate when I am clear about who I am. And I can use it to speak through like I'm doing now. And it's totally uh, okay. And <clears throat> it will move by itself. And really, there's a deeper realization that it's always been doing that. Always. When we thought we were deciding, that hasn't uh, uh, been the case. And we thought we were doing, the body was doing. If you look at all the things we think we're doing, working, driving, 
sleeping, eating, on and on it goes, raising the kids. Those are all things that the body's doing. But the self, the infinite self, has always been using the body in that way. In a, and it's only ever been confused really on the level of thought. The awareness is free and clear already. <clears throat> thought in the mind thinks it is a separate self. And thought thinks it's doing and deciding. And that's where it gets a little sticky. So for me, uh, if a decision needs to be made, I just kind of watch and see what decision appears. And at first, this seemed to be a very risky thing to do. But um, over time, I saw that this is what was happening anyway. And my thought process, trying to figure out what to do, was actually slowing down and getting in the way of that spontaneous decision. And even now, if we have uh, some event to plan or something, um, thoughts might appear. What should we do? Uh, when should we hold this? When should what time? And even my mouth might say, should we do it at this time or that time this day? But even in that, there's a very light uh, light energy around it. It's just something's going to arise out of this uh, spontaneous agreement between bodies of when we should do this. And um, nobody's really decided. Just a decision occurred. And that's a very different thing. A decision thought popped up. At some point, a thought said, let's do it on Wednesday at this time. or Let's do it in September. And it's very different to someone deciding. Because if I'm a someone deciding, I can decide correctly or incorrectly. If I'm someone uh, doing these actions, I can get it right or get it wrong. And the, the heaviness of the personal burden uh, that comes with that is enormous. We've just been carrying it for so long that we forgot we are. <clears throat> so... The experience of it on a day-to-day -day level is if a decision needs to arise, it arises. And I kind of have learned to really, really trust that. Even, um, like I say, even now I've got no idea what the next sentence will be. And that would have been a terrifying place for my mind. And it was originally, um, you know, five minutes before we about to go live for a satsang. Got no idea what I'm going to say. Sometimes 30 seconds, sometimes even as I start talking <laughs> and once or twice it was sat there like okay maybe we're supposed to just sit here in silence today so um it that's the, the the trust in that though is that everything is um divinely perfect in that way if i'm supposed to speak something will emerge if i'm not <laughs> nothing will uh and uh, it always works out and that's why you, you kind of hear teachers just happen to say what you needed to hear because that oneness is coming. The the clarity that's needed from someone emerges here. They're the same thing uh, appearing in two different bodies. And you can only get that really without the sense of a, a doer. So uh, I hope that kind of speaks to it a little bit, but please do um, uh, write back in and if you want more more detail about that. It is natural and normal. This is how we've always been. We're just coming to see it now. However, that doesn't mean uh, it feels natural and normal at first. It feels like um, uh, jumping out of a plane without a parachute sometimes. <laughs> so <laughs> until you get used to that, that's that's the way life flows best. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Helen. A wonderful, helpful thought, son. On two occasions lately, I've heard a noise. One woke me up from sleep and felt very much outside of normal existence, as though outside a shell. Today I dreamed my laptop was sliding downstairs. I woke then my laptop slid off the bed. The last one could have been an unconscious fulfillment. I do not mean it was a strange movement. I definitely caused it to slide, but it was as though my dream was a premonition. Are these things slight signs of breakthroughs? I hope so. Many thanks and love. Your last answer to my question about turning to the source for love instead of looking outside is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Glad it was helpful. And um, yeah, I remember um, in my own awakening, there were some some nights I would wake up and it was as if someone was stood right next to me calling my name, uh, as if they were stood right next to the bed. And it wasn't a scary thing. It was just... Um, my, my name was called and it was like, okay, I'm awake now. The body's awake. 
And sometimes um, when the oneness is really starting to uh, sink deeper into us, who we really are, the perception of time can go a bit bendy too. So um, we might have a sense that something's about to happen and then it happens um, more and more, uh, sometimes even... Um, even weird things like remembering things that haven't actually happened yet. And, you know, sometimes uh, things showing up in, in that way. So it could be that you had this kind of inclination in the dream state of what was about to happen um, in, in the, I was going to say the waking state, but you were asleep at that point. But, you know, when the body woke up um, <clears throat> and, and these things kind of get more common and more normal as we uh, transcend this idea that we're a separate being because um, the thought and the action in the body are the same thing appearing two different ways. I'm, I'm about to knock this off the bed and then the actuality of it um, happening, the physical action of the laptop sliding off the bed is the same thing happening, appearing in two different ways. And Usually what we would do with that is uh, divide it into cause and effect. This thought caused that physical event to occur. But as the oneness gets deeper, we realize it's not at all what's going on. So there are good little um, signposts perhaps along the way that you're heading down the right road at least. Um, and these things will happen more and more often <clears throat> and they'll just become... Um, <clears throat> excuse me uh more and more normal uh weird is the new normal as, as our awakening deepens and uh you, you can probably notice that already um because ultimately the dream state at night time when the body's asleep and the waking state they're both uh, a dream of a kind aren't they the waking state is also a dream where i dream i wake up in the morning and i go through my day and then i go to sleep at night Really, the awareness is what we are, and it's watching the dream state, the deep sleep, and the waking state. So the line kind of blurs a bit between all the three three states revolving. So I hope that helps, but uh, please do ask uh, if you need more clarity on that. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Uh, this is a comment from Maria. Thank you so much, Helen. Blessings galore. Thank you. And then we also have another comment from Oz485. Thank you for your explanation. It helps a lot. Love you. Thank you. Love you too. This question is from SK. Hi, Helen. How do I have a direct experience that I am the observer, the witness, just watching and not the doer? Thank you so much for your support. So there's a, there's a couple of ways to do this. <clears throat> and um so if if you um have been sort of diving into self inquiry, I would say that that is the easiest way, the fastest way to find out that you're not a someone doing something. You are that formless, uh, infinite um, self that is just simply watching. Um, you can see that right now uh, if you uh, look at um an object in the room and you notice that your eyes are seeing that object, your physical eyes. Also, there's something aware of what your eyes are seeing. <clears throat> and you've just called this you or me, you know, it's I, we just call it I, but it is sentient and it is watching. Right now it's watching, listening, uh, what words are being spoken and coming in through your ears. And there's something sentient and uh, kind of witnessing, isn't there? what the eyes are seeing, what the body feels, what the ears are hearing, what thoughts are coming and going. There's something like that. So Amazon delivery, <laughs> couldn't have timed it better. So um, there's something sentient about you in itself. And we normally look past that. We normally look to what we're sentient of what we're aware of such as thoughts and sense perceptions and all of that another really good and maybe fun way i don't know it depends uh it, it to prove that you're not the doer is to uh sit down if you have time of course uh is to sit down uh, on your sofa and decide that you're not going to do anything you're not going to move and just watch how long that lasts <laughs> 
or decide that you're not going to think or that you're going to keep your attention on on the awareness only, something like that. And despite your uh, best um, insistence, you'll find that the body moves by itself. And um, despite our best uh, efforts, the, the mind moves by itself and the attention wanders too. It's just going to, uh, it's just going to do that. So uh, you, you can have a little fun with this. Um, I used to, you know, times when I had to, to go out with my family and it was someone's birthday and I really hate choosing clothes as a separate being. I was always, it would take me an hour and it'd be like 12 outfits and, you know, and then originally back to the first one I tried. So I could just sit there and just look at, you know, look at my uh, wardrobe, my my closet and say, let's see what wants to happen. I refuse to choose. And eventually the body just stands up and um, picks an outfit and puts it on and goes out the door with no drama. Uh, so you can have a little, little fun with this. Um, if it's not an urgent decision to say, oh, you know what, I'm not going to choose that. I'll see what happens. And you'll see eventually something just moves by itself. And that movement is more spontaneous and free as we begin to trust that more. Uh, but if you want a quick way, just, just decide, I, I'm not going to think another thought ever. And <laughs> if you want to see that you have no control in a personal way, I'm not going to move off the sofa for at least two hours. I'm just going to sit here. Two minutes later, you're in the kitchen tidying up, doing dishes, and you know, what happened, you know? So you can have a lot of fun with this, but perhaps the, the most effective way is through self-inquiry and just asking what you really are. And there's loads of um, really helpful um, self-inquiry videos, uh, self-inquiry playlists here on the YouTube channel if you want to have a go with that. If you haven't already, you might have done. So, yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Karen. Uh, this next question is from Luchika. Hi, Helen. At one point of, of my life, your work helped me to progress. I remember at that time, it came clear to me that I don't feel one with all and that this is important. I worked on it and I felt expanded and calm. However, the experience faded away. I feel again more or less an isolated individual. Maybe I need constant reminding. I'm writing this because the theme of my life is blockage. I cannot move. I cannot progress and fulfill my desires. It's probably inherited family karma. What does it have to do with feeling one with all? I don't know yet. I feel there is something in it. So one of the first things that's going to happen once we've had a kind of glimpse or experience of that oneness um, is that a desire is going to arise in us naturally that we want that all the time. Of course, of course, we want to feel that deep intimacy with with everything and everyone. And the lack of utter lack of division is felt in the body as um, deep, deep peace. And, and it, of course, uh, deepens over time into love and uh, joy, um, yeah, bliss on all of that. So when that desire arises, what, what it's going to cost us to live like that uh, is all of our thoughts about ourselves uh, as a separate being. And one of the first things that's going to happen is all the usual suspects of our karmic patterns are going to show up and say, hey, how are you going to handle me from here? So uh, if you look at the, the challenges that you're having being blocked or um, challenges with other family members, challenges with money, whatever those are for you, what do they look like from oneness? Are you going to believe those from the oneness? Nothing is going wrong here in this you had this uh we used to call it try before you buy this little uh, teaser trailer of why it's worth doing this work that we're talking about here questioning these these thoughts and for me when i looked back at everything was coming up after uh my first kind of recognition which was a very ordinary moment of wow i don't really think i'm separate to anything immediately after that and i, and I mean immediately like 10 seconds came this feeling of uh, frustration and uh, why can't I live like that it was the next thing that came up. And for a long time, I believed that. I really 
it was desperately painful until I realized that doesn't apply to me if I am everything already. If I am everyone, if I'm everywhere, if there's only one being here, then whatever each body and mind is experiencing is that one that's showing up as that. So you'll be offered these uh, karmic patterns again to see uh, what they look like from oneness. Is it true you can be blocked if you're infinite? Is it true you can be not progressing in your awakening if you are already all that is completely free as the awareness even now? And it's very convincing, isn't it, to go with the old illusion totally. But luckily, your body will help you. Your body will say, this thought that I'm not there yet is so opposite to what I've seen to be true. And it feels icky and awful. And I, I don't like it. And then when you come back to that oneness, that can't be true for me. And then um, the body responds and goes, ah, oh, you know, that kind of, yeah, that's better. And then the next day, maybe you have an argument with another being. And there's lots of thoughts about that other being. Okay, am I still going to agree now that I have a challenge with this other being, even though my experience is shouting it at me? This experience is coming from the remnant of my uh, habit to think of myself as a separate being. So you kind of have to go through this review process of all the places that you're still holding on in thoughts about separation, about other beings. For me, that were certain family members. Um, you know, Christmas dinner around the table was was not an easy time. Um, certain other things like uh, money, time, uh, energy, never seem to have enough of that. Like, uh, and I was going to see, I'm still believing I'm separate to that energy that I seem to want or need separate to the patience that I really, really didn't seem to have with other beings, separate to the uh, compassion that I wanted, on and on it went in ever more subtle ways, um, separate to the self-love I was trying to exhibit, uh, separate to the judgmental thoughts I was trying to get rid of. So it will be uh, things that we're trying to get rid of, things that we're trying to get, inherent in that there's a separation, isn't there? Um, and how to get those things and get rid of the things we don't want is to realize I am those. I am those two. I can show up in that way. I can show up as impatience with someone. I can show up as the other someone. I can show up as compassion. I can show up as bliss, fear, and everything in between. And um, most of all, I would like you to hear that nothing is going wrong in your awakening. This is the uh he, here's what you are and now apply it to the sticky points in your life that's what life will ask of you here's a, a glimpse of what you are so that you can look at these things again now when they come up and go that that it's true as a separate being but i've seen that that's not the case i'm not really separate to anything and it helps us to break that kind of hypnotic uh, illusion thing that we have going where we're just like transfixed with these thoughts, even though they make us feel terrible. We, we still somehow buy them anyway, thoughts and separation. But once we've had a glimpse and that desire is, uh, well, for me, it became all encompassing. I have to live like this. I have to. I can't seem to accept anything else now. I can't go back. I've come too far. I'm kind of, you know, the only way is forward, so to speak. And this is how you do it. In a, a thousand little moments like this, am I going to look at this being uh, or this thing or this attitude or this emotion as separate to me? That's the default setting we come with, isn't it? And we just have to turn that around. There's a a huge myth in awakening and in human consciousness that a deep enough seeing is going to absolutely obliterate all of our separation thinking. And it's just not true. Even Ramana, who had this amazing experience, it took him three years after that to uh, learn how that oneness moves in the world. And we don't hear about that bit, do we? We hear about the big uh, moment, the, the big seeing. But I've never met a being um, 
that didn't have to go through this kind of intermediary process. We were talking about the retreat we'd just been, been to. Um, Christ said, um, first you'll seek uh, and then you'll find. And when you find, you'll be, and I'm paraphrasing, um, you'll be troubled. And then when you're troubled, you'll be astonished. And this troubled bit is where I've found, and now life is giving me all these things uh, to to look at again from what I've seen to be true. Because we can only resolve them from there. <clears throat> and then um, comes the astonishment, you know, living as that unitive oneness where there's just awe and wonder and joy and all the things that we really want. But if Christ had to go through that troubled phase, you know, I didn't feel quite so bad about having to do it myself. And you will come out of that. It just speeds up at this point and it's um, thick and fast. So going through that with the understanding that it's meant to be happening and it's nothing you're doing wrong, you'll navigate it much easier. Thanks, Karen. Um, this question is from Scott. He says, I realize I have divided my world into two realms. The grasping of oneness with no separate objects where I feel I have progressed and the illusionary separate physical world where I desire to achieve even while knowing the illusion. Knowing oneness does not help me function in the relative world where most operate from illusion and lack. I still believe I need to impress an employer or customer in order to achieve my worldly desires as a matter of practicality. I find it confounding that I can find calmness in the grand scheme of things and even death, yet can be pulled into the mundane little things from the seat of awareness. What is happening? Well, I'd ask you to, to listen to the previous answer I've just given to the previous question as well. That would be helpful. Um, what is happening? Uh, awakening uh, is deepening. This is totally natural and normal, unpleasant, very unpleasant. And it feels very, very much like our world is divided into two, my spiritual seeing and all that's progressing there. And then this um, other thing that seems to be going on where I keep getting sort of yanked back into identification as a separate being and all the uh, emotions that come with that, the contractions in the body, etc. So it's normal. And uh, it is part of how awakening deepens. Um, like I said, it's not pleasant. But if you understand why it's happening, uh, it's easier to navigate. And that this is what every sage has been through on the way to uh, permanent peace. So what's happening then is that life is showing you now um, <clears throat> all the places where that oneness needs to be integrated. So most human beings would walk into the office and wouldn't for a second think that their boss is the same as them. And there'd be lots of thoughts about the boss and uh, <clears throat> that makes them seem separate. The more we think about something or someone, the more separate they seem to us and the more there seems to be something to think about or someone. So it cycles around this illusion. I really don't like my boss in any way. He won't just give me a break. On and on it goes. And I'm not saying that's what you're thinking. I'm just kind of um, using an example. And the more I think about this person, the more they seem outside of me and the more divided I feel and the more urge there is then to defend myself or uh, try to be a certain way with this other being. If I can get him to like me, need me, all of that stuff. And we do it with our, our boss, our siblings, our parents, our co-workers, even our Sangha members uh, when we first come into an authentic community. We, we bring these same ways of being. So for me, it took some uh, inquiry, you know, is this, what really is this person? What really is this emotion? What really is this um, thing that I, I am sure is outside of me? And it won't be that you have to apply this everywhere. Excuse me. <clears throat> There's only... Um, a few places, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten beings that we have a real problem with. And uh, perhaps, you know, for me, it was like I said, money, time, energy, those things uh, that seem to be very separate. So I had to ask, what really is money? We did this as a group at retreats. It was very, very powerful. Came to a, a seeing, all of us, that it is the infinite silence appearing. It is myself. 
the self appearing as uh, money and time and all of these things. So all you're doing really, what's happening is the clearing up, you're sweeping up now the fragments of the separate self where it's left a bit of a mess. It's had a little party in your house and now we're just kind of clearing room by room, you know, just, uh, oh yeah, I still think that person's separate to me. So you see, and then you apply, you see, and then you apply, you see, and you apply. And as you apply, the situation turns around with that being or that thing, and you begin to experience abundance. Um, <clears throat> abundance is not just financial, it's in every every form. Abundance of peace, joy, time, energy, love, compassion, on and on it goes. And of course, financially, you know, more than enough is abundance for me. So as you apply and you see that area of your life turn around, you get even more inspired and excited to apply in another area and so on. So it cleans itself up pretty quickly. The reason that it doesn't, we don't get started with it, is because we think we're doing something wrong. We think that, why is my life in such discord? My my meditations are amazing, mind-blowing, you know. And then next thing I know, I'm arguing with my wife or my uh, child or the dog won't do what I want, you know, and uh, on and on it goes. So nothing is going wrong here. What's happening is you're, you're being asked to give up your thoughts about others. And for me, oh, that was a big ask. I was like, but I like my thoughts about others. <laughs> I don't really um, want to give them up. But when I, when I looked, actually, the places where I had a lot of thoughts about other beings and other things, things that I wanted and needed, things I really wanted to get rid of. Um, those were the areas of my life that really weren't flowing very well at all. And I began to see the correlation between that. The more, not in a personal blame way, not that I'm screwing up my life. It's just, I can't really experience the oneness when I'm obsessed with thinking about two-ness uh, in this area. So life is just asking us to clean, clean house, so to speak. And um, unfortunately for this, you can't hire cleaners. You have to do this one yourself. Um, but uh, it's well worth it because the joy and the energy that comes from um, realizing your oneness and, and that there is nobody and nothing to be scared of. There's nobody that you need approval from. There's nobody that you need love from. It will just be oozing out of you, that oneness. And um, in fact, you might even begin to experience some really strange things like your boss uh, Your boss suddenly seems to like you, you know, who knows. Uh, some very surprising things happen from, from that place because you're not um, trying to constantly change everyone you meet subconsciously. You know, what most human beings are doing is doing is, if you behave this way for me, I'll like you more. You know, and I'll behave this way for you so that you like me more and we'll have this unspoken um, agreement that goes on. So finally, when that's dropped, there's such a rich joy and authenticity being you. Like, you know, really didn't know who me was then. Like, what, what do I, what happens when I go to Christmas dinner without any expectations of everyone? Wow, that was pretty amazing, you know, so... Nothing's going wrong. You're just being asked to, to clear up where the separate self has left a little bit of a um, a mess, let's say. And no blame on yourself. This is, this is the process of embodying this awakening. Thanks, Karen. So the next question is from Maria. Um, she says, my question for the next time is, what do you think about the new theory that is turning out to be more than a theory according, according to quantum physics? and the last Nobel Prize winner about this being a simulation or matrix reality? If so, should we be able to stop physical pain and suffering by transcending it? Well, I don't know too much about physics in that way or whatever the, the Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, I haven't kept up with all of that, but uh, my experience, uh, and not because I'm against it or anything, I just, just um, for, for lack of time really, uh, I used to be deeply interested in all of that. Um, and I think I once bought a book on string theory and I got two pages in and I had a headache. I put it back on the bookshelf pretty quick. So uh, my experience is uh, that 
well, was that the 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 waking state itself was seen to be a a projection, a a matrix, if you will, a simulation, um, and that everything I thought was going on in that waking state and the dream state at night time was really not happening in the way that I thought it was. That I was dreaming with my eyes open and my eyes closed, you could say, and um, where our senses are just perceiving, they're taking in vibrations, and our mind is constantly overlaying that with names and shapes and labels of things. It looks at a particular vibration through the eyes and calls that a name. It would say Helen or mom or cat or whatever. So in that way, very much uh, there is this kind of simulation thing going on. And at times it breaks down. You notice those moments where you're just admiring a, a sunset or looking at something in nature or having a good laugh at a movie and you, you're just not really uh, uh, constantly supporting and sustaining that that simulation. And there's peace and joy for a moment, and although albeit momentary because we haven't realized the real source of joy. So I don't know if I'm on a par with what uh, what they were saying, but that, that was kind of my experience. And um, it is a, a waking dream that we're living. Um, this idea that I'm waking up in the morning, your body wakes up, gets out of bed, your body goes to sleep at nighttime. You remain as you always are, just here and witnessing that. So thank you. Um, this next one is from Johnny. He says, hi, Helen. Question that comes off the heels of in, of indivisible self, which I love, by the way. Anyway, so if we're undivided and not separate, which I get, why is it that a certain type of people or group speak of themselves as spirits and souls and refer to the past lives that they've lived, etc.? Yes, it could be a continuation of the narrative of the separate self, but the rub for me is when people speak about NDEs um, and traveling outside the body, that's experiential, where they get information supporting this experience, and I have trouble reconciling oneness with that. It seems they have validity to their story and seeing and experience themselves outside the body, referring a here, there perspective, and implying location. So what is it that's going on there, and how does this line of oneness and no separation, and how does this line up with oneness and no separation? It's a very common question that I get, and um, it, it confused me for such a long time. I have had experiences of kind of leaving the body and, and things like that, and um, uh, met some people with uh, who'd had near-death experiences, and it was clear to me that there was something between, and I'm going to use that word as the best way, between the body and the oneness, there, there was something that was learning and growing and evolving as all these different bodies come and go, um, which gives the sense of a succession of lifetimes. And we could call that the soul. We could call that um, astral self. We could put some many names for it in different cultures, but uh, it, let's just go with the word soul for now. Um, and the ester is the formless, uh, indivisible oneness from which everything arises and it is not a thing, and it is not an object. It's everywhere indivisible. And then from that arises, apparently, because it's still made of the same uh, formlessness, uh, an en energetic individual, which we could call a soul. So the one being seemingly separates itself into an infinite number of souls, but never actually does because they're all still made of that oneness. So the analogy we've used before is waves on the ocean surface. The wave uh, seems to arise out of the ocean and seems to be different to the ocean itself. It has a shape, a duration, all of that. But it's still water, still joined with the ocean. And really the wave when it arises is a movement of the whole ocean like that into uh, so the soul, we could say, is individual and unique, but not separate. It's never separate from its original source. It is the original source. Uh, everyone uh, is um, unique on that level. 
And uh, we could also use another analogy if it's helpful of a tree. Uh, so the oneness is the trunk of the tree. And then this, uh, imagine that this tree has infinite branches. And in each branch that extends from the trunk has uh, a lot of different little branches on it. And these little branches are all the imagined lifetimes. So there's this, uh, an individual soul that arises out of at some point as an idea only, because it never really did, uh, arises out of the oneness. And in order to learn and grow about it, uh, learn about itself and grow and evolve, because the oneness isn't learning, growing or evolving, but this individual um, and not separate soul wants to learn and evolve and to do that it takes different bodies it has uh, uh, bodies come and go in it it experiences itself through that body while it's in uh, using that body it forgets its original nature and then when it pops out of that body whoa that was a really vivid dream that was a strange you know I really thought I was that body that's and then I'm never going to forget that again and then the next body comes and off it's gone again and it's forgotten again but in each lifetime, uh, it's it's um, imagining itself to be separate, but never actually so. So it's using the the bodies, um, <clears throat> and it seems to have uh, a location, a point in time and space, a finiteness, but never really actually cut off from everything else and everyone else. And we can see that on an everyday basis. Have you ever picked up the phone or gone to call someone and then knock on your door or you text someone and they were just about to text you. These are not just coincidences. This is the oneness, the interconnectivity, because the soul is just energy vibration. And where one vibration stops, another one meets. Is there really a stop? No. Could you stop a wave that's moving like this? And of course, you know, science is beginning to, to prove this as well. So you could say that the soul is a collection of uh, memories from these past lives not my past lives but past bodies I've had you could say past incarnations that have happened inside me and in that that gives a successive sequence uh, appearing over time there seems to be um, a succession of lifetimes happening and yeah, which the the soul is using to uh, learn and grow and here we are seemingly right really far down that path now learning about our source no longer so interested in exploring an experience and separation more. It wants to wake up from that amnesia that it keeps falling prey to when it uses a, a human body. And <clears throat> that's what it's doing in, with this human body, isn't it, that we're using, these bodies that we're using to communicate this with. So it, for me, reincarnation all of that I'd had many memories from previous lifetimes that I couldn't reconcile with the oneness you know but the understanding that individual and unique does not mean separate was the, the real game changer for me and that the universe the infinite self is so amazing that it can appear as an infinite number of souls going on an infinite number of uh, each individual soul has an infinite number of choices it can make and an infinite number of bodies it can wear for a while and that's mind-blowing isn't it when you really kind of get that um, and it's using all of these apparently separate but not souls and bodies to uh, explore itself the oneness to understand about itself like you're having i don't know eight billion human experiences all at the same time you're pretty cool, huh? <laughs> so hope that helps to kind of explain. Uh, for me, the difference was um, I always thought the individual meant separate and unique meant separate. But actually, I'm a word nerd. Individual comes from indivi and dual. If, they, if we break it down into the Latin, indivi means indivisible and dual means two. So the indivisible oneness appearing as two or many or billions individual but never separate hope that helps thanks karen and that's it for today wonderful thank you so much karen for helping me with that my pleasure
So uh, just to to wrap up before we finish, um, the next uh, one of these it will be uh, at the twenty volume twenty two will be at the end uh, uh, the eighteenth and nineteenth of December. If you have anything you want me to address in that, um, please just leave it as a comment under the YouTube video, and uh, we'll address it next time. Thank you so much. Namaste.